Welcome. Uh, oh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, this is the third London City lecture that we're doing. Um, and we're excited about, I'm excited about this one. So tonight we're talking about reading the Trinity. So tools to help all of us see the triune God as we go to scripture and read it for ourselves. Uh, and to sort of give you a, a brief introduction where this is coming from. So we started and the first lecture was uh, trying to give a rich description of the doctrine of scripture, uh, the word of God as an act of revelation wherein God tells us about himself. And then we looked at why we have confessions, which tried to argue what are summaries of the Bible's teaching. And tonight we, we try to bring doctrine and our understanding of scripture together. So how, do, how does the scripture read well give rise to doctrine and should we read scripture in light of the fact that we believe in some of these things already? And I hope you'll come away with some new strategies to read the Bible and see how God is triune. So uh, I hope everybody at least has access to an outline. If you're sitting in the back, there's not one there because we put them in the front. Uh, that wasn't a mistake. Uh, so if you don't have one, you can either slink to the front and grab one and take it back, or you can move forward. Um, and if you've got a Bible there with you, uh, I, I'm not going to give a lot of time to turn to passages. So they're listed there so that you can be working ahead to get to the, to the passage as we move through it. If they're in brackets, I'm not going to read the passage. I'm just going to cite it just to explain that. So the word Trinity comes from a Latin word that means threeness. And it is trying to give an account for the way scripture affirms that there is one true God and that that true God is three persons. And those three persons are bound together in the Bible in God's identity. Namely, what I mean is that all three perform the acts of and receive the worship due only to the true God. The doctrine of the Trinity explains how the Father, the Son, who became the incarnate Christ, and the Holy Spirit are all three equally God. And the basic point is that the one God exists in three persons. The obvious question for Christians who believe Scripture is how this truth rises out of God's word. So this lecture focuses on biblical interpretation and reading it to see the triune God. And we're going to consider our assumptions and our techniques for reading the Bible as that relates to the doctrine of the Trinity. And the purpose here, just to sort of be forthright about it all, is not to outline in full the doctrine of the Trinity or even to treat passages as a list of proof texts for you, but to highlight for you how to see the Trinity across the Bible's full story, to make us aware of these issues as we read scripture. So, so the emphasis here is not so much on any given passage discussed, but on the method and on the issues involved as a tool for reading scripture for yourself. And so uh, the first section that we need to think about is adopting ancient assumptions. So one writer has said that the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And we tend to assume that that means we do things better. But this sort of chronological snobbery should be questioned. It is probably obvious to, to most of you who have watched any sort of historical documentary <coughs> excuse me, that modern people do not think about the world exactly the same way as ancient people. The assumptions we have were not their assumptions. And in some cases, however, they should correct us. Some ancient writers had massive literary output and described philosophical paradigms with which we still interact and engage. We should not think that they were inferior intellectually. At least we should not assume that. And the primary assumption 
that differs between <coughs> excuse me, ancient and modern thinkers relevant here relates to the way that truth is communicated. So moderns often assume that truth is communicated only by direct propositional statement. So if I want to say something is true, <coughs> excuse me, then I need to say it in argumentative prose, and I need to be explicit. And so that leaves little room for communicating through reflection on historical events, through narrative, or through implicit or inferential argumentation. And this relates to the Trinity because many modern people have argued the Bible does not teach the doctrine of the Trinity because no one passage explains in plain and argumentative discursive terms how God is one in essence and three in persons. The assumption that discursive scientific writing is the only way to convey truth is deeply mistaken. And it is mistaken because it does not understand that there are, in fact, other ways to communicate truth besides philosophical and scientific argumentation. This view misses that the Bible does teach exactly what they deny, but oftentimes in other categories of communication and argumentation. And this point is important here because we will encounter several ways of thinking about the Bible, particularly when it comes to reading the relationship of the Old and New Testaments. And these are crucial to putting together our doctrine of the Trinity. We gather the doctrine of the Trinity from across the whole Bible, especially as the Bible tells God's story. So narrative discourse, storytelling, in other words, as we consider it here, includes not just books that are outright telling a story, but also the whole Bible, including places like Paul's letters, as they draw upon and fit within the scripture as part of one unified story about God. So we should not understand the importance of narrative to mean that <coughs> biblical writers lacked systematic categories, or they didn't think principally and coherently about doctrine, but this narrative category can help us understand that the Bible does communicate truth and doctrine as, so at the same time as, it describes events, as it tells stories, and as it reflects upon history as God has orchestrated it. The Bible does teach clear categorical doctrinal truths, and at times it teaches them by using narrative structures. In other words, history and narrative have real theological full value. <laughs> so some of the advice here for reading scripture then amounts to not much more than we need to learn to pay attention and take account of how biblical writers intended stories to do more than, not less than, but more than record events, but also meant them to communicate the deeper theological value of those events. So sort of getting that framework in place, we're going to turn to consider some of the more specifics, looking at the one God's one story. So a category for seeing the Trinity in Scripture that some find difficult in thinking of script, is, is thinking of Scripture as God's one ongoing story. It's a unified book. The Bible records events that actually happened, and God stands behind those events. We must read Scripture not only in close contexts, but also so words, sentences, verses, that sort of thing, but also in the broad context of God fulfilling the promises he made throughout the whole canon. So we have to deal with how Jesus came and he and his disciples understood this event to be part of the same story that God began in the Old Testament. 
God had promised in the Old Testament to save his people. And in the New Testament, Jesus saves God's people. Jesus' work and the Holy Spirit's work fulfill actions that God promised he himself would do, which indicates that this (coughs) canonical story presents God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Spirit as God. This means that we have to keep New Testament stories and statements in the perspective of Old Testament stories and statements. So essentially, this is an elaboration (coughs) (coughs) of what the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 11, says. How does it appear that the Son and Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? The Scriptures manifest that the Son and Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father, ascribing unto them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God only. And now we need to start thinking in terms of specific passages, though. I don't just want to be theoretical. And Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, grounds this principle about God's one ongoing story. So, let me read that passage to you. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. (coughs) For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Okay, there are two relevant points for, from this passage for our point. So the first is the relationship between Christ and Moses in these verses. They are both stewards of God's one house. <clears throat> Christ deserves more glory, but both are agents in the story about God saving his people. You see that? So Jesus completes the God's story, which God had already begun through Moses. The second aspect worth noting in this argument in verses, is in verses 3 and 4. So small words are important in reading the Bible, and one of the most important words uh, Here is the word for, which often means because, as in the case at the beginning of verse 4. So verse 3 says that Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. And the more glory he deserves compares... I know that this is sort of mind-bending, maybe, but pay, pay attention. The more glory that Jesus deserves compares to how much more glory the builder gets compared to the house that he built. So no one ought to praise the house itself, but the craftsman who designed the house is the author to the Hebrews point. And now verse 4 states the reason that Christ is worthy of more glory, like the glory of the builder over the thing built. He is worthy of more glory than Moses because someone builds every house, but God builds everything. Now think hard about that for a second. About how Christ is worthy of the glory a builder should get because God builds everything. So what we must infer from how Christ is worthy of the builder's glory and the builder is God, is that Christ is God. But what story, to think more broadly again, what story is Christ completing? 
all the redemptive story <clears throat> that included Moses' work. So there's an overarching story about what God is doing, and Jesus plays God's role in that story. And this indicates how we have to be alert uh, to, um, <clears throat> how we must be alert to required but yet implicit assumptions as well as the raw statements of Scripture. We must recognize the Trinitarian structure presupposed throughout the Bible's narrative. We may not fully understand that God is three persons at first, but that should actually be expected when we realize that the Bible is not a set of propositions, but the story of God saving his people. Some parts of the story are fully revealed later in the plot, as in every single story. So, that sort of, I hope that grounds the principle that we're after trying to see one story of the same God throughout Scripture saving his people, and Jesus takes on the role of God. And now we're going to look more specifically, though, to, to see how to work this out. And so we're going to look at the story of the Trinity in reference to Christ. So the doctrine of the Trinity rests on a host of biblical considerations, primarily here, how the apostles clearly reread the Old Testament in light of Christ's coming. Biblical authors model for us how to interpret Scripture as a whole when they reflected on Old Testament texts with consideration of Christ's coming. For example, Hebrews 1 and 2 is an extended exposition of Christ's preeminence. And to prove that point, the author cited a host of Old Testament passages <coughs> in Hebrews 1 and 2, namely from the Psalms. So this rereading <coughs> teaches us that New Testament writers necessarily rethought the fuller meaning of Old Testament passages now that Christ has come, but also that they did not see their rereading as allegory but as more fully understanding the divine author's intended literal meaning of the texts. They came to see that Old Testament divine references had reference not just to God in general, but to the Son of God, who was with <coughs> the Father in eternity. This reinterpretation, however, happened in light of what the person Jesus Christ did on earth, meaning Christ's coming was an act of revelation. Christ's life was an historical event that revealed more about God's inner life in new clarity. It revealed more clearly that God was multi-personal, tri-personal specifically, and it revolutionized biblical interpretation. So many times <coughs> that Paul invoked the category of mystery, he referred to how the Old Testament was not clear, that, or at least not overly explicit, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, would be the divine person who redeems God's people. For example, Ephesians 3, 8, 9, Ephesians 5, 32, Colossians 1, 25, and 26. Post-New Testament, or theologians after the New Testament era, had to keep reflecting on these same issues and incorporate new terminology to explain <coughs> what they saw in the scripture. But the big question is, right, what biblical passages forced early church theologians to start formulating the Trinity more precisely? And we're going to look now at some passages that signal for us the Bible's depiction of Christ as a divine person and these passages created pressure within that canonical biblical story about the one true God that pushed early church thinkers to speak of the one God as three persons. In other words, we look at parts of the scripture that ascribe to Jesus things that ought to be ascribed only to God. <coughs> when stories present 
Jesus with the divine identity, or the logic of a passage assumes Jesus has a divine function, it forces us to think about Jesus in particular ways. Specifically, if there's only one God, and Jesus is doing things that God does, Jesus is a person of the Godhead who has assumed a human nature. So understanding the Trinity in the Bible is not just about, to sort of sum up and get us to this point, is not just about reading propositions, as I've said, but is also considering how the New Testament authors apply the Old Testament to Jesus Christ. The events of Christ's life and the way the gospel writers describe them often tell us a huge amount about the deity of Christ, the fact that he is God or that he is one of the Trinitarian persons. So Mark 6, 45 to 52 is an important example. And so this event occurs directly after Jesus fed the 5,000. Starting in verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, (coughs) to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. (coughs) Excuse me. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came... The boat was out, at this, out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth hour, or fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened, referring back to feeding 5,000. So this may not be the first passage you think of when we consider the Trinity. If somebody asked you to prove the Trinity, you probably wouldn't go. Here, I bet, until tonight. But it's an important example of the reading tools I want to show you. Uh, so this passage does, does not prove Christ's deity simply because he miraculously walked on water. That's not the point. There are two points to note that link Christ's actions into the identity of God. So first, if you look at verse 48... Mark told us that Jesus meant to pass by the disciples in the boat. Now, if Jesus' intentions were limited to the bare action of walking faster than a boat, I mean, that would actually be, seem to be an incredibly odd point for Scripture to make, I think. But this is actually important divine language taken from the book of Exodus. So in Exodus 33, Moses is in God's presence atop Mount Sinai, pleading for God to remain with his people as he sends them into the promised land. And God grants Moses' request to remain with his people and apparently desiring confirmation of God's promises to be present with his people, Moses asked to see God's glory. This is a relatively famous passage, and we We read in verses 18 to 23, Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he, God, said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and where my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So Exodus tells us, that God confirmed his promise to be present with his people by making all my goodness 
pass before you with the qualification that Moses could not fully see God. In contrast, Jesus is, is the fulfillment of God's promises to be present with his people and so means to pass by the disciples with the difference being that while God was somewhat veiled for Moses, we see God fully in Christ. Second aspect from Mark 6. Walking on the water is more than just an impressive thing. And that's an important thing to note. So Job chapter 9 verse 8 says, He, God, only, so God only, stretched out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. The book of Job is about a suffering believer, and Job 9 is Job's response to Bildad the Shuhite, one of the shortest people in the Bible, who had said that bad things happened to Job because God was punishing unrepentant sin. Job said that no one could stand righteous before God if put on trial, and that God was superior to creation. And one of his arguments about why God is superior to creatures and why God would stand victorious if we tried to plead our righteousness as a reason for good things to happen to us is because, so, is because God is the only one who is able to tread on the waves. And then we read of Jesus walking on the waves. The narrative entails, since Jesus did things only God does, that Jesus is God. And so we can see something similar in Mark 4, verses 35 to 41. <coughs> On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was, in, so Jesus, was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And it is indeed that last question that takes us right to our point. This passage is also more, is about more than Jesus just doing something impressive as it applies Old Testament divine language to Christ. Psalm 135, verses 5 to 7. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is is above all gods, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes the lightnings for all the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. So Mark attributed actions that properly belong only God, to God to the person, Jesus Christ, the disciples who would have been well-schooled in their Old Testaments would know these verses from the psalm, as, many, as well as many others. That's actually just one example about God's mastery over the weather. And Jesus did things that God does, and that tells us who Jesus is. He's God. And that establishes the point about God's one story from narrative texts themselves. But we can also see how the narrative of God <coughs> fulfilling his promises in his son's works, also undergirds non-narrative passages. So Philippians 2, 5 to 11, which is incredibly important for all sorts of reasons about the Trinity, but we're going to consider one. So beginning in verse 5. <clears throat> Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Jesus 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, listen, so here, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there are multiple crucial Trinitarian points from this passage, but the one pertinent for our purpose of gaining tools to see the Trinity in the Bible's narrative scope comes from the verse from verses 9 to 11. So in these verses, Paul argues that the culmination of Christ's saving work earned him high exaltation and a name above every name. And that will result at the end of things in every knee bowing to Jesus and every tongue confessing that he is Lord. And that point is significant to understanding the Trinity because Paul took this language outright from Isaiah 45, 22, and 23. God speaking and says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall swear allegiance. So Paul actually cited Isaiah 45 and applied it to Jesus. But note that in Isaiah, God is the one talking. And God said, to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue swear allegiance. God is not only the proper recipient of this type of worship, but God himself swore that this worship would come to him. And yet in the New Testament, God ensures that Jesus receives this worship. And so what do we conclude? That Jesus is God. Jesus is owed the worship that God deserves, and therefore there is only, <clears throat> and therefore since there is only one God, must be that God. And we can take another example of this from Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <laughs> now, okay, some people get hung up in this passage on the phrase firstborn of all creation, but we should simply read that in light of everything else here. So verse 16 says that all things were created by Christ, by him, which means anything that is created was created by the Son, and that means the Son is not created which verse 17 reiterated when Paul wrote the Son was before all things. The Son was not created, which in itself states his deity. But this passage also ascribes the work of creation to the Son. The Old Testament framework clearly positions the one God as the only creator. And here Paul credits God's creation work to the Son. That point from Colossians is underscored if we consider the famous Trinitarian passage, John 1, 1 to 18, and which is a touchstone passage for Trinitarian theology, which means that you can get a good discussion of it uh, in any good book about the Trinity. So I want to highlight a specific aspect of that passage, particularly to our point for reading strategies. So in John 1, 1 to 5, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. So John's got... I, I said a while back, right, that the apostles clearly reread the Old Testament in light of the Christ event. And this is a clear example that John's gospel opened by rereading Genesis 1 in light of Christ's coming and reframed the creation work and God's eternal life in reference to the Son's eternal existence. The Word of God, meaning the Son was with God since always before creation, and the Word was God, the deity of the Son, clearly stated. There are echoes of Colossians 1 here in that the Son is involved in the creation of everything that was created. In other words, the historical event of the Incarnation made the Trinity known more clearly, and we see how the apostles reflected upon God's own identity in light of what Christ did on earth, and then applied divine works to the person of the Son who came bodily as Jesus Christ. (coughs) And I sort of hope that the reading strategies I'm advocating are clear already, but it's important to be explicit that the Trinity is not two persons, so it's not the Trinity, but the Trinity, so, but three, so we should consider the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we're going to think about the story of the Trinity in reference to the Holy Spirit. And again, the point has to be made <clears throat> that this kind of reading requires that we pay good attention to what Scripture says, and that we do not rely on cursory readings of isolated verses. We can begin, actually, with some evidence that remains within the confines of the, the New Testament itself. So, <clears throat> Acts 4, 32 to 37, describes the, the life of the early church and how believers had all things in common, meaning people gave sacrificially to provide for other believers. And then in Acts 5, 1 to 11, uh, that story continues, uh, recounting, noting how Ananias and Sapphira tried to deceive the church about how much they gave. Importantly to note, the problem was not that this couple did not give everything they owned to the church, but that they lied about how much they gave. So in verses 3 and 4, we read, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was, <clears throat> was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So notice in verse 3, Peter stated, Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. And in verse 4, he lied to God. So there's a clear implication here in how Peter spoke interchangeably about the Holy Spirit and about God. He clearly equated the Spirit with God, which entails the Spirit is God. Peter associated the Spirit with God's identity, which gives us the cue to watch for when the Spirit as well as the Son is drawn into that divine role. Now, Paul did something similar in uh, making a similar attributive claim by calling the church both the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, and the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So the Holy Spirit is God and has equal claim to God's temple. These scriptural examples are sufficiently clear, I think, to demonstrate the basic point of the Spirit's deity and that He is eternally God, as seen particularly, eternally God, uh, as seen particularly in Genesis 1, 2. Genesis 1, 1 to 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth, earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So this verse sort of nails 
this down for us from the beginning. That God the Spirit was there from creation, as was the Son, as we have already reflected on the Son's role in creation. Now, though, uh, we still want to see this sort of cross-canonical principle of how the Scripture ties together persons of the Trinity as necessary to identify the one true God in application to the Spirit. And so we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7 to 18. So this chapter, as you turn there, this chapter is about the superiority of the new covenant over the Mosaic covenant, particularly as its ministers proclaim a message that in the new administration of the covenant of grace is the same as the substance of the covenant of grace in announcing Christ's life-giving power that the Spirit affects. So, turning to the passage. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze on Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? (coughs) For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness much far, must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But... When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, okay, this passage draws from Exodus 34, where Moses had to put a veil over his face after speaking with God face to face in the tent of meeting because his face would be shining. Paul read that in verses 13 and four, 13 to 15, sorry, to indicate that the Israelites could not bear to be directly confronted with the true effects of God's glory because of their hard hearts. <coughs> when one truly comes to God, however, verse 16, this veil is removed, and we can delight in what the Lord does, as Moses took off his veil when he went to speak to God. <coughs> now, Exodus 34, verse 34, reads, Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And Paul drew on this, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. His comments in verse 17, so this is is where the, the reading principle comes in. His comments in verse 17 interpret how Moses met with God. And his point in saying, now the Lord is the Spirit, is to, he is explaining there Moses' encounter with the Lord in in Exodus 34. So to summarize, I think this is helpful to paraphrase Scripture at this point. By the way, the Lord with whom Moses met in Exodus 34 was the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, Moses met with God in the tent of meeting. He met with the Lord. By the way, in this instance, the Lord was the Holy Spirit. And verse 18 confirms that the Lord, who is the Holy Spirit. With good attention, therefore, Paul read this Old Testament event about the Lord to be an encounter with the Holy Spirit and described God's identity 
in Exodus 34 to the Spirit. Now, if that one seems tricky, it's the most tricky one. That's why I did it for you. Uh, so I hope that helps. The, the rest, if you can get your head around that one about the Spirit, uh, the rest should be at least easier. But the point, I hope, is clear that the apostles in writing the New Testament are ascribing the roles, the actions, the identity of God to the Son and to the Spirit. So let's, let's come to a, a close here. We, we have seen that to understand the Bible in its fullness, we must read it as one story with a nuanced account of who its main character, namely God, is. We see clearly from later revelation that God's identity can be fully understood only in recognizing the relations that God, Jesus, and the Spirit have to one another in identifying the true God. We cannot, therefore, afford to read script. So here, yeah, here's the, the practical exhortation. We can't afford to read scripture inattentively but must notice the significance and meaning of the way that Scripture describes the character, action, and reception that God, Christ, and the Spirit have. So we have to pay attention. We must note the Scripture's yeah, intertextuality or cross-textuality, the way that texts use other texts within Scripture that demands that we identify Jesus and the Spirit in precise reference to God. We must then be careful not to dismiss, and I think this is really important, we cannot dismiss as ancient peculiarity things that seem odd and out of place to us in the Scripture, particularly in narrative proper, like we've considered, because the oddity may be exactly the things the ancient writer intended you to notice in order to flag something very important about who our God is and how he is triune. And so we consider our God across the whole story of the Bible and we look to see how scripture describes Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit in light of God's identity as revealed to us across our canon. I hope that's helpful. Let's pray and then we'll take some questions. Father God, we have indeed considered heavy things. We have thought about things that are difficult for our minds to grasp. We will never exhaust the mystery of how our God is triune, how the God in heaven is Father, Son, and Spirit, one in essence, three in persons. We default and depend upon language we learn from our fathers in the faith, and we're thankful that they've done the work, but we are thankful that we can, as we turn to your holy word, see these things rise from it anew if we pay good attention. So we pray that you would teach us to treasure the richness of Scripture. It is not an uninteresting book. It is indeed an inexhaustible book. And it is one upon which we can indeed meditate, not just upon the things that strike us as what we should do today, but we can meditate on it about what it says about who you are and how you our God, our three persons. So we pray that you would teach us to treasure up that truth that our God is triune and that we would marvel at who you are because of it. We do pray these things in the name of Christ, our blessed Redeemer. Amen.